I know some of you wondered if I was coming today. I, uh, how many know church is about the Lord? It's not about the pastor. Somebody say amen. Uh, but I have, for some reason, been under the weather a few times. As I'm on my fourth round of antibiotics in the last uh, less than probably three months. And so, um, don't have anything that we know of this is contagious except that my nose keeps running. I know some of you thought I just stayed up all night celebrating and praising the Lord for the Dallas Cowboy win. Uh, although that did give me a little bit of a boost, I'm still in shock because we won a playoff game and it's been a long time and so uh, God is good. But this morning I want to share with you, in just a moment I'm going to pray with you, but I'll ask you to pray for me and then we'll pray together. But um, got a, I got a message for you today that I think is going to be exciting. I um, want to let you know we're going to push plug in uh, for all of our folks interested in becoming members of our church. Uh, we're going to push that back a week. So next week we'll be plugged in one. Um, as soon as service is over today, um, Roman will close us in prayer. And uh, for your sake and my sake, I will jump out of here. But um, if you're a guest here today, I just want you to know that uh, I love this church. We're proud that you're here. And uh, we have a great vision for what God is going to do in this community and what He's already doing in this community. Amen? Amen. All right, pray with me. Father, we love you and ask that you will provide uh, strength to all of us, Lord, those who are sick at home. Uh, um, thank you for, for healing those, those maybe undergoing different treatments. And God, everybody that's just been sick because um, of the weather and, and just the mold or whatever it may be in the air. Lord, we pray for health over our church, and we ask that you give us a sound mind this morning. I pray that you will move in spirit and move in power, and I pray that your presence will be felt and your focus will be all over this place, from the kids to us and everywhere. We thank you, Father, for your glory. Apart from you, we can do nothing. It is in Jesus' name we ask and say, Amen. Amen. This morning, if you'll find your place in the book of Exodus, just joking, if you'll find your place in the book of Matthew, those of you who attended church at all last year got that joke, uh, Matthew chapter 28, Matthew chapter 28, I make no promises, we may wind up in Exodus again, Matthew chapter 28, there's nothing like some coffee and some Sudafed and some Mountain Dew, Amen. Matthew chapter 28, and today we're going to be sharing something and walking through something that I find is, is very important for us as we look towards the new year. Uh, Pastor Matt was asking me if I was going to be preaching on New Year's resolutions, and uh, because that's the cliche thing to do. Anybody still ever seen a pastor preach about that? Um, but we are going to be talking about something that I would love for us to take a refresher course through, and that it would be uh, something that we would do, it'd be the heart of our church. And so this morning, Matthew chapter 28, I want to start there in what's called the Great Commission. Everybody say great. Uh, some people have said in the church, and I want to teach you something today, some, a lot of people have said the Great Commission has become the Great Omission. In other words, uh, many of you may know what the Great Commission is, maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't heard of it, but today we're going to walk through the Great Commission and I want you to see, once we get into context, once we get into these verses, I want you to see and remember, and everybody say important. Let's try that one more time, important. This is an important passage of Scripture. You could say this is an important message. It's not necessarily the message that's important. It is the Scriptures. It is what's implied that is very important. So... Matthew has gone through, at the, this is at the very last chapter of Matthew, Matthew quickly kind of goes through the resurrection of Jesus, and I praise the Lord that He's resurrected and we have a way out of sin. Amen. We have a way out of an, etern an eternity separated from God, and we will be with God. And so he quickly goes through that, and then he goes to the end, and I believe that it is important as the writer of the book of Matthew, as Matthew takes this moment and he ends this book, there are some important things that he quotes and he notes that Jesus said. So now in verse 16, Matthew chapter 28, 
It says, now the eleven disciples, everybody say eleven. Now some of you are like, well, I put down a lot of why only eleven disciples? Well, uh, Judas Iscariot, he betrayed Jesus, and then after that, he took his own life. He, he was very remorseful, he comes back in, throws the money down, and then he takes his own life, and so now they go from twelve down to eleven, and so it says, now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And we asked the question, where is this mountain? Nobody knows. <laughs> we don't. And so, verse 17 says, And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. When in fact, through this season, what Matthew is talking about here, Jesus has already been resurrected. People have already seen him. People have already... Uh, uh, the, 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 the ladies that came, depending on which accounts you read, there's been various people, the disciples. It's not like this is the first appearance of Jesus after the resurrection. <laughs> Jesus has directed them to go to this mountain, and it, is, it, is, it brings some question to me why in verse 17, I, I get the fact that when they saw him, they worshipped him, because anybody that sees Jesus ought to worship him, amen? Yeah. If you come into the presence of Jesus, you ought to worship him. If, if we're singing songs to Jesus, we ought to, we ought to sing them from our heart. Uh, some, of, some of you will lift your hands. Some of you will kneel. Some of you will stand there. And, and, and whatever mood or mode you're in, as long as you're worshiping, that is what matters, church. And so when we come into the presence of Jesus, when we see Jesus, when we read the Word, when we see Him in our lives, when we make it through something, when God answers a prayer, He's always meant to be worshipped when you run into Him. But what's interesting to me is that the text says, but some doubted. In other words, some commentators have various theories about why some doubted. Uh, maybe because, uh, the, 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 did the eleven, did they doubt? Because they were directed to be there and they saw him, why would they doubt? And some say, maybe they gathered there at this mountain because uh, oftentimes Jesus would gather in these types of places because crowds would come and so some have said maybe there were more uh, there than just the disciples and when they seen him, they doubted that that was actually Jesus. And so... That's a possibility of why some may have doubted. In verses 18. And here we go. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Everybody say all. Oh. Now this is important. He says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now, I've asked the question, what is important about Jesus' mention of His authority? Well, here's the interesting thoughts. A man with authority named Jesus allowed Himself to be crucified. Okay? From a human perspective, that doesn't look like a man who's in authority. But how many of you know Jesus willingly put Himself on a cross? Or allowed Himself to be placed on a cross? And so now Jesus has been resurrected and Jesus has appeared to these people and he's letting them know, I'm no longer, I, look, I've already completed my task. I've already played the role as 100% man and 100% God. I've already lived this sinless life. I've already gone through the modes. I've already gone through the motions. I've already held myself in check for some 33 plus years. I have done it. And he comes back and he says, I'm alive. I am well. I am real. And my Father in heaven has given me authority over all things. There's nothing that Jesus Christ doesn't have authority over in your life and in my life. In other words, now they are looking at a man who, if he says he's got all authority in heaven and earth, what he's saying to them is that he is just as much as God as the Hebrew God they've been talking about and worshiping for some couple thousand years. In other words, Jesus lays it down in front of them that He Himself is the Lord, is the Master, is the King. And He says to them, all authority has been given to Me. And when Jesus sets it up and says, every ounce of authority has been given to Me, and then He wants to say something. And I don't know about you, but anybody who has the power and the authority that He can do anything He wants to in the universe, in the world, in heaven, if He says to listen, we ought to listen. 
And so here's what he says. Everybody say go. He says go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. How many of you thankful this morning Jesus was with us always? Because there are some times. I mean, not just in losing seasons. Come on, fans. <laughs> Raise your back fans. You, you better be glad God's still with you. But there's some seasons when we really need to remember that. And so, why all nations? Well, Jesus has spent years training these disciples and spreading the word in this particular area. And what he's about to do is set the stage for all of that hard work that was done in one little place. I don't know if any of you have ever started a business or you've ever started, hey, I'll just say that started a family or whatever it is that you started. Have you ever started something, church? Right, right. Maybe you started college. Maybe, maybe you started high school. Maybe junior high. Maybe, maybe, maybe all these different things. But when you start something in a small area, Sometimes people can't withstand the time that it takes. How many of you wish you could just go straight to the top right now? Come on, be, be real with me. I'm not judging you. But Jesus started something in a small area, and he spent time on it. And he didn't just hop out and leave until it was ready. And what he started in that small area, and the time that he put into those people, and the effort that he put into that area, and the effort that he, the, the, the time that he spent teaching them about himself, teaching him about God, teaching them about the ways you should walk and the ways you should live, he's, he put a lot of time in that one little space. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I have felt like in life and in ministry, have you ever felt like you spent so much time working on one thing and you wondered if you would ever move on to something else, if you would ever reach that dream? Getting an education and becoming, a, for, for example, I'm going to say doctor because I've been to a few of them lately. That doesn't just happen overnight, church. We have a lot of Christians who want an overnight success story. But things that are successful and things that are lasting rarely happen overnight. Everybody say, wake up. And Jesus knew that if he would take a few people, if he'd take 11 of them, if he'd take 12 of them, he'd take anybody who would listen. He would train the women. He would train the men. He would send them out. He sent 72 out. He sent them out two by two. He knew that, if, that 33 years was long enough for him to start something that would never end until he came back again. That he would put 33 years on earth. And that he would so change the world in 33 years. That a couple thousand years later, here we are in a metal building where we spray painted everything we could one color so it would look pretty decent. That we'd still be talking about that person that only lived 33 years. Because what started small, it grew and it grew and it grew. And I don't know about you, but God knew that what he started back in, back in those areas that he traveled and poured into those people that he poured into, he knew that it would eventually reach Crittenden County, Arkansas. <laughs> I have eyes in the back of my head. <laughs> but he knew it would eventually reach us. And oh, I'm so thankful that it did. Church, this is obviously was not in my notes, but you, you need to remain faithful to where you've been planted. Because eventually something will break out. If God has given you a promise, and no, this is not uh, uh, some type of do what you want to, pick what you want to, pour into what you want to, and then get what you want to out of it. If God has poured something into you, and He's told you to focus on an area, this is what's different about growing churches. 
We think growing churches is simply just getting a crowd to come. We don't just need a crowd to come. We need a crowd to commit. We need 10 people to commit and 20 people to commit and 30 people to commit and 40 people to commit their lives to Jesus. And when you commit your lives to Jesus, it multiplies. People that just come and hear something and say that was good and they say, holla, see you next four, five, six years from now. Nothing grows out of that. But when you take the time to allow Jesus to pour into you every single day, even though you don't want to, even though it's not always easy, even though sometimes he checks your he checks your pride at the door. Even though sometimes you get up and you go to work and you don't feel as good as normal, if you will continue to grow in the Lord, something will be burst out of it that the world cannot contain. And so what was poured into you, what he poured into those people. <clears throat> At 30 years old is when, when, when everybody pretty much says Jesus' ministry started. He lived 33. And in three years, his ministry, thousands of years later, still reaching, woke you up this morning, got you out of bed because of this man named Jesus who called these people to a mountain after he'd been resurrected and had something very important that he wanted to say to them. I don't know about you, but I think the Holy Spirit's on this one. So why on the level we, we discuss that? Why? Where is this mountain? Uh, we don't know. Who's the mountain? What's the right response? And, and when we see Jesus, it's to worship Him. Why would some doubt? There's various reasons. Sometimes things seem too good to be true. Verse 18, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And we read that one already. <laughs> Verse 19. Everybody say, 19! Woo, man, I remember being 19. This last year. <laughs> I'm still feeling 22 like Taylor Swift. But anyway, uh, verse 19 says, Oh, yeah, I want to go to the baptized part. We're, we're caught back up. We made it. All right. Hope all of you are going to that Bible study that flashed up, though. I don't know if you noticed that. All right. Why baptize in the name of? I want you to see this. And verse 19 says, Go therefore and make, to, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name. Notice that's not names plural. <laughs> this is good right here for all you people who like to learn about Jesus. And we've got a church full of people who love to learn about Jesus. Amen? Amen. Why do you say name? You're going to name three different names, but you just said name. Is that a typo? Problem in Greek? And problem in the ESV version? Like, what's the issue here? It's because we even see here that Jesus could have been telling them and showing them they were all three in one. It's the Trinity. And that's some of you, uh, maybe that's a new term for you. The term Trinity is not actually in the Bible, but it is something that we take from the Bible when we see that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all three and they're all one. We don't worship multiple gods. We worship one God who is three in one. That's why we don't baptize them in the names, uh, plural, of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Ooh, that's, that's just, man, that's just good Bible. Maybe I'll get my doctor to be a professor. I like it. I like it. Everybody say he likes it. Yeah, I like it. So that's why when we baptize, that's how we baptize. Matthew 28, 20 says this. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Don't you fall asleep right now. Because y'all, I'm going to tell you, there's some fun things about the Lord. Hey, seeing God answer prayers is fun. Can anybody say amen? amen. Like, seeing God come through when you can't, you don't know how light that's going to get paid. And don't y'all all act in here like it ain't never happened to you. And seeing God come through. Like, when you're really hungry and somebody leaves some food or, or somehow, some way, you find a gift card you never used and you don't have to cook dinner that night. Like, sometimes there's some reasons. Like, Lord, please give me a good parking spot across the community. I got my high heels on today and it's gravel. <laughs> They're two big four by fours. They park so far apart, I can't squeeze my car in there. And then that time you pray, you just roll it up and say, Whoo, thank you, Lord. He said, Thank you for the good, good prayers, man. And you like that stuff. We like that stuff. I like it when God comes through and pays off an acre of our land before it's even the deadline. Amen. I like that. It's a lot less stressful. But he says something to them. Because so far, so good, right? Like, baptize them. Yeah, that's fun. I don't, some of us don't know why it's fun. It just is fun. Tell 
about Jesus? That's great. And then it's like, <clears throat> and uh, teach them to observe all. There's that, oh, that word again. How many of you wish you could just pick out your five favorite commandments and stick to them, right? Like, right? I know Jesus wrapped them all up in two, and I get it and all that. I'm with you with the New Testament theology and all that stuff together, but he does mention the Ten Commandments also in the New. Anyway, the sad kind of changes, flips from sad. Anyway, moving on. But he says, teaching them to obey all? Like, everything? I mean, everything. I got to come down here just for a minute. You mean that one sin that I really love? Like, Lord, I already gave up. I don't need to name any more sins. And I already gave up, you know, taking a little extra out of the cash register. Y'all still awake? Uh, I, I, I mean, I am not as bad as I used to be. I, I'll say it like this. Lord, I, I ain't what I used to be. And I'm going to do some really good things for people. I'm going to love them. I'm going to give them a time to them. And, you know, I'm going to help them out when they need this and they need that. But there's a few sins, Lord, that if we could just make a deal. I mean, we can't make a deal with God. The deal is, He has all authority. You don't. Right? You come to the Lord. Let's make a deal. I'll keep this sin or I'll keep this issue here. I'll, just, I'll take care of that issue. I won't let it bother anybody else. Just let me hug my issue and have my issue. Just let me have my problems. I feel like some of these conversations happen in your house. Honey, I know, but just let me have this. It's never happened to me. I'm always on the wrong end. I just want to confess that to you. Within three feet of my wife, and all of y'all gonna say amen. amen. <laughs> Mama ain't happy, nobody happy. But there's some things I want to hang on to. They're fun. It makes me feel good when I do it, except when I remember that it was wrong to do it. And the Lord is challenging God's church today particularly in the South, particularly in areas that already have heard about the name of Jesus, that we are called to follow all of His commands. We are called to follow Him. And so I've given you a summary. Some of you enjoy summaries. I'll give you some points down here. Matthew 28, 19 through 20, commonly known as the Great Commission. Sometimes I throw 18 through 20. Let's say 19 through 20 just for the fun of it. God calls us to make disciples, which is a follower of Jesus. Okay, that, that term is not in itself a biblical term. Okay, it's in the Bible, it's right. But anybody can be a disciple of anything. If you want to learn and follow someone else's teaching or a person that, uh, if you become an apprentice to, some, to someone that, that's going to teach you how to uh, build something or make something or do your job. Anybody can be a follower of someone or something. If you're with me, say I'm with you. But this is very important to us because in, in those days they would understand that terminology. We need to understand the terminology. To be a follower of Jesus is to fulfill the Great Commission. We baptize disciples and followers. We teach disciples and followers. And number four from this, we remember that God is always with us. And Jesus was probably telling them that He was always, He was going to always be with them because He was going to ascend back into heaven. And not only that, many of these disciples became martyrs. In other words, they died for their faith. And so if your life is on the line when you're sharing some news and you're scared and you're afraid because you know you've got to share the gospel, you know you've got to share Jesus, and, and, and you know that you've got to do the will of God, but you don't always know the outcome, then they needed to know Jesus was never going to leave them, nor was He going to forsake them. In other words, no matter what happens to us on this earth, Jesus is still with us and we can rest in that. The happy ending is heaven. Everybody say heaven. And so... I hear you, Trey. Father, we love you. We thank you for your answers. We thank you for your great commission. We thank you for your word. We ask you that we will be a great commission church. 
that we will be followers of you and not just people who connect ourselves with Jesus, but we follow you. And Father, we do pray for our future here in this facility and on the facilities and property you've planned for us. And we ask you to provide, we ask you to outdo any dream or any thought we could ever perceive because the people that are coming are the most important thing. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. So is this what comes to mind when you think of being a Christian? Like, uh, what we're talking about today, making followers and following Jesus and baptizing them and teaching people to, to follow the Lord and, and remembering that God is with us, is that what comes to mind when, when people share the gospel these days? Some, and, and there's no particular one that comes to mind, per se, none in the area, but pastors and preachers ought to be ashamed of themselves if we don't share the gospel the way Jesus did. Or at least the best way we can, isn't it? So how does the Great Commission help our church? Got some practical ways here. Number one, it helps our church. Because it keeps us focused on God's plan. How I many you know the church doesn't need to be focused on a bunch of other junk? The church needs to be focused on what God's plan is for our lives. It's all about God. It's all about Jesus. This morning, can you accept that life is not about you, but it's about the Lord? Number two, it protects us from becoming stagnant. Everybody say stagnant. In other words, if we as a church stop focusing on reaching people, learning and growing in Christ, teaching people to follow His commands, and then hitting the repeat button, then the church can be focused on the wrong thing. With over 50% of our county that does not have an affiliation with a church, we don't have time for that. And so, we must always be going, but we must always be growing in the Lord. Number three challenges us to become more Christ-like. I don't know if you knew this or not. I really don't know if you do. Becoming like Jesus is a lifelong journey, y'all. To so some of you, that ought, to, that ought to give you permission to exhale like, okay, it's going to take some time. You'll be riding really good for a while, and then the Lord will talk to you and say, ooh, well, we're going to go this way now, Adam. I said, Lord, I was really trying to avoid that way. <laughs> Can't we take a shortcut? <laughs> Jesus knew and died for our sins while we were still sinners. In other words, God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. Who's ever, like, he loved us before He died for us. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our tendencies. He knows our strengths. He knows our capabilities. But what He needs from us are willing hearts who come Monday, we don't lose track of who we are as a Christian. Come Tuesday, if we miss it by a mile, we come back to the Lord and say, Lord, please forgive me. I've got to get back on track. He needs people Y'all, this world, crazy stuff happens every day. Crazy things are going on. People need the gospel of Jesus. How do we reach people in the culture? And this is this is really part of the matter. Sorry, y'all, ADD moment. I just can't hardly leave a Bible sitting on the floor. It's too precious. How do we reach people in a culture where most people have heard about Jesus and are under the false presumption that they are Christian? If I say Christian. In other words, how are we going to reach people like if I, if I told you, let's go out and tell everybody about Jesus, some of you probably be like, yeah, amen, right? Let's go tell them all. Have you ever realized that most people that you come in contact with that are old enough to talk 
think they've already heard about Jesus? Like some of us are like, okay, I'm going to tell somebody about Jesus, but he knows and she knows and they know and he knows and, and they, they live by a church. I mean, they've heard about Jesus. And, and so how, it seems harder if we were to go to a nation. By the way, Jesus is going to come back once the gospel has been brought to every nation. The scripture says it, believe in Matthew chapter 24. So, but they've heard about it. So what do we do here at Crittenden County? Crit County. How do we reach people? Well, the first thing we need, to, we need to do is we need to stop, we must stop pretending that most people are Christian. Now, this is not offensive language. But we assume way too much that just because somebody attended a service at some point in their life, or they had somebody in their family, or just that they're a nice person, that they, they must be Christian. I see this often, oftentimes I see this at funerals. I mean, somebody passes away, they ain't hit a church door in 40 years. And want me to go up there and tell them how great of a Christian they were. I better stay right here. And I'm thinking, yeah, God knows their heart. That's what some of you are thinking. You don't know their heart. No, I don't. But y'all, when you follow Jesus, it's really hard not to tell. Like, if we if we live for the Lord. For any extended period of time, it's going to be really hard for people not to know that that person right there, they follow Jesus. First of all, children are different. Everybody say different. How are we going to reach these people in culture? Well, the difference is children, many of them, have not heard the gospel. So we focus on reaching our children. And so your children may not have heard the gospel and they may, or, or they may have heard it in the church or they may not have. They may need to explain it. We have the opportunity to tell children and sometimes teenagers, I mean sometimes adult people can make it but never hear the gospel. But we focus and we tell our kids about the Lord. And any parent in the room, I know mine's probably not old enough to understand yet, but how many of you want your children to follow Jesus? Sometimes we want our children to follow Jesus more than we want ourselves to follow Jesus. There is a love for our children that God has placed in the heart of man. And so we share the gospel with our children. At our church, we host special events specifically designed for kids. Have you ever noticed that? That isn't just so we can have fun, even though I like having some fun. Well, we try to get people to come and we invite others. Sometimes we do it as Easter egg hunts, and we do that off-site on purpose. The last few, last I think the last couple of years, they've allowed us to have the football field there in the old football field of Renetti Field, where I did have an interception return for a touchdown one time, and I think John the good fellow can verify that. One time. And people come, sometimes hundreds that would never step into the door of our church, but they came to the Easter egg hunt. And we host these events for their kids. There's two folks right now, I could mention them if they would, would they mind, would they mind? You mind? They don't mind? Okay. No, this means yes, right? Okay. But Sam and Elliot Driver came to an Easter egg hunt. They were invited by some church members. They brought their babies. Because who doesn't like something for your kids to do? <laughs> Come on. Y'all go do that for a minute. Eat some candy, we'll do it later. <laughs> they were really scary guys. <laughs> well, they come, and from that Easter egg hunt, the Lord started working on them. All of a sudden, they find themselves across the community church. All of a sudden, we got to fill up this old uh, $350, $350 baptistry we got here. It's really more than that with the heater if it works right, but anyway. 
And God has changed our lives. But not only that, see, they, see they, they, they answered the call to follow Jesus. Right? They were baptized. But I meet with them once a week. We've been doing this for a few weeks. And sometimes schedules get in the way of this and the other. But I meet with them to kind of help them get a foundation. So from one Easter egg hunt, not only have their lives been changed, but their kids' lives have been changed. That's why we do what we do. And that's why we'll do anything except sin. We'll do whatever it takes to reach people in this county. If it's an Easter egg hunt, if it's, if it's, if it's having an ugly sweater party, if, uh, and a chili cook-off with the same family wins the shirt and the chili contest, <laughs> we will do whatever it takes. And you get to be a part of that. You can have the kids have a giant sleepover. We'll pray for you. I mean, I ain't coming home, but I'll pray for you. <laughs> you take them all to church. You never know when they're going to hear from the Lord. Just bring them all. Find a reason. Tell your kids. Invite, invite your friends to church. Invite your friends to church. Invite your friends over. Invite your friends over. It's a great way to reach people. Now, how do we do it as adults? Sometimes it's harder with folks who. Oh, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. I'm like, saved from what? We share the gospel with friends and family. We invite, if I say invite. We host special events specifically designed to reach adults. Courthole tournaments. There's some people who show up, I want to win that. Better be careful. I got my own set at home and me and Val are going to be practicing. I'm not saying we're going to win because that's a little bit too boastful in the house of the Lord and I've not won one yet, so that'd be silly. <laughs> but this time, you know, you do things based on age, you do based on hobbies, season, etc. Now we're now hosting a Bible study at our house. If you've noticed, it has an age type appropriate thing where uh, you have to have some children. I mean, we're not going to tell you if you're, you know, the age is... Lots of people can be certain ages and have children that are 18 years old, but we set that up on purpose because we're hoping that you'll invite some people to come and that we can reach a specific people group that isn't being reached as much as the others. And so invite some people to the Bible studies and different things. On February 10th, we've already got the spaghetti cooker reserved. He doesn't get paid. He's really big and he's really tall and he cooks good spaghetti. Well, we're going to have a Valentine's banquet. I'll give you the price next week. Last year, I believe it was $5. I'm not going to tell you it's $5 today because, you know, inflation and stuff. Anyway, i got to run it by the finance team. Like, I've done that before, and then I go to the finance team, and I'm like, Adam, you, you, you need to figure out what it costs for you to tell everybody. It's, okay, I thought, okay, okay. Goodness. I did it by faith. <laughs> But if you would invite some people to, well, I don't like spaghetti, bring some Sonic. My goodness. I don't like Sonic either. <laughs> Go somewhere else. Bring it. Act like you're on a fast and just sit there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like Texas toast. Great things come from Texas. <laughs> but use this event. Please, I'm asking you. This is a year to reach. If I say reach. reach. It's a year to reach. We've never had a foundation that we have right now. We have great Bible study leaders. We have great people in leadership positions. We have a great worship team. Everything flows on Sunday morning. We have great Bible studies before church starts. We have Bible studies that meet off campus. We have so many things in place that now we are built and ready to reach. We can handle the growth because we've been spending that time and on that little circle and those people are ready and God has sent them and we are ready to reach. And I'm asking you throughout this whole year, reach. Just stand ready this morning.